Welcome to episode 15 of Talking Prisoner. We have another amazing guest with us today. She starred in 52 episodes of Prisoner, but in two very different roles. One as an inmate and one, of a, one as an officer and a love interest for Joan Ferguson. But not only was she on Prisoner, she starred in Cop Shop, The Flying Doctors, Neighbours, also played two characters on Neighbours and also wrote for Neighbours and also wrote the most iconic death on Neighbours of Todd Landers. Also wrote for Something in the Air, Blue Healers, Winners and Losers. Welcome Margot Knight to Talking Prisoner. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good afternoon, Ken. Good afternoon. How are you today? Good? Yeah, I'm, I'm really good, thank you. And the sun's out, beautiful day. <laughs> Excellent. Now, we've got a lot of questions about Prisoner for you, but first, we'd love just to get to know a little bit about you and where you were born. Ah, right. Well, I was born in um, Sale in Victoria, which is a small town. No, it's not so small, but it's in um, Gippsland. And uh, back then, I was born in the uh, army barracks, which was converted into a hospital um, back in, the, in those days, in the 50s. <laughs> and uh, I was there a couple of years as a baby, and then we moved a bit further down the road to Tarelgan in Gippsland. So I was there till I was about 12. Then we moved to the city, we, then we moved to Melbourne. Into Melbourne after 12, okay. So that's where you grew up as a child. Um, what did you do, what did your parents do for work? Well, mum was a housewife, it was the 50s. And um, uh, not that women didn't work, but not so many women did then. And uh, she had been a dental nurse um, when she met my dad. She, she's a Bathurst girl, grew up on a dairy farm in Bathurst, my mum. And um, they're both deceased now. And uh, my dad was worked for um, Australian paper mills. He was a trained forester, um, you know, botany, forestry, that kind of thing. He trained at Creswick College in um, Victoria and then went um, to Gippsland. So he was um, working in the the forest down there um, you know his idea of a good time on a Sunday would be to um, drive through the, um, the 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 pine plantations after they'd been burnt burnt because he was also captain of the country fire authority the CFA uh -huh. down there so we would have have, a, have these country um, Sunday drives where we'd see all the burnt out sticks of the forest because there were some pretty serious major bushfires down there and dad would be would be one of the key people fighting those fires so um that was kind of into he thought that was pretty entertaining for us to do that <laughs> interesting <laughs> you know, good educational <laughs> yes yes good for us <laughs> what um how, how did you go at school what what oh what, how did i go I the question yeah. okay so you mean was I sort of into into school? Yeah, when you when you were at school. Um... Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I was absolutely so so studious. I was actually ducks of primary school. Oh wow! And um, I don't know that many schools have ducks, but they did back in the day. Um, I had been that same year. Um, I had been very, very ill in, um, in hospital with um, what's known as encephalitis. Have you heard of that? It's a brain inflammation. And, um, and I was in isolation and I was really, really ill. Um, and I remember, I was 11 at the time. <laughs> I remember all of the students in my class were obviously told that they had to write, because there was this question about whether I was going to kind of pull through, you know. And it was Easter and they had to write me a card. And so all of these cards arrived at the hospital. And I thought, oh, these poor, even my worst enemies had to write me a card. Not that I don't remember having worst enemies, but there were a couple of boys that we, you know, you know, boy, 11 year old boys, a couple of them, and they had to write me a card too. So I had to get, everybody had to write me a card. I thought that was pretty funny. Then I went back to school and, um, and became ducks of primary school then. When we moved to Melbourne, I went to um, Merton Hall, which is Melbourne Girls Grammar. And um, 
I was there um, right through high school and I was extremely studious then too, Latin, French, you know, all of those kinds. Of, it was a pretty academic kind of environment. So um, there you go. And then yeah. I didn't, I didn't uh, become a, a, high, a, a great, a great um, academic. I then went to drama school. Oh, much, to the, much to the shock of my parents, because <laughs> you know, I said, but you could get in, you could do this, you could do that, you got into this, you got into that. Uh, I'm going to go to drama school. So they didn't support the idea of drama school. Well, they just thought that I had so many more options, you know. Yeah. And I suppose that's true, but it's no good if you don't want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you? Uh... I, I, Naughty enough, I did get, I was naughty too. Oh, you were? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you have any, uh, any hobbies at the moment? Any hobbies you like? Uh, well, well, I'm, um, you know, I mean, theatre is my great love. So one of the things that I miss more than anything is going to the theatre. That's yeah. what I'm missing during lockdown. Um, I was always going to the theatre. So I suppose you'd have to say that's my biggest hobby um, but now I mean I'm reading listening to audiobooks um, I, I like to go walking I did some very very long um, so, walk, solo walks um, in Europe bef um, I was there a couple of years ago in France so I've actually walked from the Swiss border right across France over the Pyrenees wow. and into Spain I've actually walked that whole way um, I stopped when I got over the Pyrenees because I only really wanted to walk across France. And, um, and I wanted, you know, I was there because I love the French language. Um, that's another of my hobbies. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm, I've, I've got a degree in French. So I did want to um, walk across France and do this whole journey. And I did, did it on my own, I went on my own, but I just met up with people all the time and had a fantastic time. And, Wow. You know, so that's a that's a hobby, walking. Mm. Yeah. Does, um, does your hobbies include cooking? Oh French yes. Cooking, maybe. Well, I, I've got some French cookbooks that my daughters, I've got two adult daughters that um they gave me. And uh and I have look, I do love French food, so I make a very good tap tap tan and um a good um coco vin. Um yeah, I like cooking. Love French food. Really? I did the whole sourdough thing for months and months. I think I made 150 loaves of sourdough during Melbourne's <laughs> first oh. lockdown and sort of beyond. I was forcing them on people in the end, my kid giving them to my kids. <laughs> we ate a lot of it. <laughs> Very good bread. Yes. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. So we know yeah. out of school you went to drama school, but what did you do as a job? To support yourself after school or getting through that. okay so for a short period of time i did waitressing because i also wanted to travel in the holidays and um you know in those days in the 70s education university was free and i was um on scholarship and it was enough for me to get by so that i didn't do a lot of didn't have to do a lot of other um, work and then I really did start pretty well I started working straight after drama school um, I taught for a little while for a few months and then I got a job on television comedy the Daryl and Ozzy show when it went um, ah. when it went five nights a week for a short period of time for a few months it went five nights a week and I was on the comedy team the three of us, there was um, me and David Cameron and Brian Hannon. And we used to do crazy skits in the studio and characters and it, 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 all these comedy scripts. And they would go, we went live to air. We would go in front of a live audience every night of the week. Wow. Um, this is a little known fact about my career, but that was my very first professional job out of drama school. And, um, we, I remember the very first night we went um, live to air and I think, I can't remember what the character was, but it was a skit. I think I was some sort of school teacher in this particular character. And I didn't know 
this is, get this one, Ken. I didn't know that when the red light went on the camera, that meant we were on. I didn't know any of it. I had to be sort of told everything. <laughs> this was my sort of blooding into the, um, into the, the live television. <laughs> so that was pretty funny. You know, Carmen Miranda put a big thing of fruit on your head and, and I, 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 you know, <laughs> sort of, I, you'd get a script and the night before and then you'd have to be a, you know, Russian-Hungarian princess and, you know, with, with one leg or something and then you'd be looking up all your accents and doing all your prep the night before, kind of, what's, what's that accent? And sort of having a bit of a go with the, you know, with, back then we used to have phonetic books and charts and, and records and things like that to do our accents. It's not the internet or anything like that, of course. So have a really good sort of crack at it. And I was pretty good at accents. And then the next day you'd rock up and just do whatever you thought was a good, a good version of it. And nobody, you know, said anything because who knew? <laughs> it wasn't like, wasn't like SBS where you could just kind of ring up SBS and say, get me a blah, blah, who can, who's got... <laughs> <laughs> it was really left to the um, to the acting fraternity to, um, to to sort of supply the accents, and we just did the best we could. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we um, before we get into prisoner, yeah. I'd like to uh, talk about neighbours, which you wrote yes. for and starred in. And I might add, you wrote one of the most iconic episodes of Neighbours with Todd Landers dying. You first appeared on Neighbours in 1986 as Jean Richards and in 1997 as Tracy Cox. And then as a writer, you were working on Neighbours in 91 and 92. How did you get the part on Neighbours as Jean Richards? And coincidentally, you played two characters on Neighbours also. Yes, interesting. Well, look, I think, I don't think I auditioned for that because I'd already was known um, for, um, for my work. I'm pretty sure I was offered that role. Um, so it would have just come through, um, I may be wrong, but I don't remember auditioning for it. I remember being offered the role. And uh, I did have a lot of fun working with Gary Files course um oh, Gary, yeah. <laughs> yes you know and, and and of course there was Peter O'Brien and Kylie and all those people back then um and uh you know I think Kylie was about 16 at the time um but it was a a, a great um a great experience neighbours because again you know it had been a few years since um since Prisoner and how what did you say 86 was it is that when I did Neighbours? Is that when I did Jean Richards? No, yeah. earlier than that. Younger, I was younger. Than that. Mm. Uh, it, it, was it the Channel Seven or was it a channel? It was ten. It was ten. 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 Yeah. yeah. Once it went to ten. Well, it, yeah, it's probably about. Um, it could have been even about eighty-five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe no, I think it was. I think it was even sooner. Maybe no. Maybe it was eighty-five because I think it was a. Yeah, it was not round then I met my husband. So, you know, good, yeah, good. That's good. That anchors it a little bit. Mm, yeah. That was actually one of my next questions to you, who you mentioned who you worked with. So at that time you appeared, there was Alan Hopgood, Guy Pearce, Kylie Minogue, Peter O'Brien, Jason Donovan, who are all amazing yeah. actors. I mean, yeah. Do you have any memories of one of them that you could share with the fans? I have memories of all of them. Um, Peter O'Brien's a rascal. Kylie was this little sweetie. I remember, you know, she came to lunch with us early on and she really was, she was a kid, you know, she was so young and so had so much um, potential and boom, you know, it wasn't long after that, I think really, that she kind of took off. Jason, lovely guy. Alan Hopgood has become a very dear friend and we worked together for 20 years in um, a company called Health Play, which he founded. Um, touring health plays all around Australia. So I, you know, I spoke to him two days ago. I, I, um, he's a mad demon supporter, so I had to ring him up and give him, wish him well. Um, and uh, so we became really close and worked together and travelled together and toured together for 20 years. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. Episode 297 
uh, in Neighbours, which was directed by Steve Mann, who worked on Prisoner as both a cameraman and a director, was your last episode of Neighbours. Shane Ramsey, played by Peter O'Brien, who was driving, had a tyre blowout and your character died. <laughs> yeah. Were you wanting to stay on Neighbours longer? Um, well, I knew I wouldn't be. I knew it was a fixed term contract. So I had, you know, the script well in advance. I knew that. Um, and of course, I, at the time I would have, you know, I was enjoying myself. Um, but, you know, psychologically, when you know you're going to finish, you know, and it's, it, you know, it wasn't a shock or anything. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, in 1991 90, and 1992, you came back as a writer on Neighbours and wrote 15 episodes. Now, this one I want to talk to you about is a, it's classed as an iconic episode. It was directed by Steve Mann and it was the death of Todd Landers. And the Herald Sun rated it one of the most iconic deaths in the top 10 of Neighbours. Uh, <laughs> and it did break a lot of hearts because I remember being at school at the time and every girl at my school loved. Todd Landers. Yeah. After he died, they were, I mean, they were broken hearted. They came to school and they had posters of him. I mean, they, they were all just, <laughs> it had such an effect on people, that episode. Can you, uh, <laughs> can you tell us much about that episode? Did you, was that your idea to kill him off or? No, with these um, shows, uh, key events like that are already in the storyline and they're mapped okay. out. Now that is going to have that was going to happen. The yeah. fact that I was given that to write um, is pro was probably a function of the cycle of scripts that come around, and you know I had this this script, and it was my turn to write that week, and happened to get that script to write. Okay. And um, and so all I knew was that 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 he had to die. <laughs> I had to make that happen. <laughs> It was such um, an intense episode because I actually rewatched it a few nights ago. And, you know, Phoebe's going to get an abortion. He's trying to save it. He gets run over. And then in the hospital, it looks like he's about to pull through. Everyone's happy. And then he just yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, look, um, I used to love writing, um, writing then, uh, Neighbours then, because, um, you know, it, it, it's a medium where you can kind of, you can express yourself and I mean I had a, a baby who was probably about 18 months old and you know I could write in my pajamas I could sort of you know I, I could do it at night day anytime I wanted to and um, I entertained myself no end it didn't matter really whether somebody had to die or somebody was getting sick or someone was getting married or someone was having a fight it was all good stuff to me all grist for the mill you know it was just um, I'd be sitting there crying my eyes out. <laughs> you know, and then people would be having a fight and I'd be like, flipping away, you know, kind of like getting right into it. I think um, I think being an actor was a, was a natural for me to be, to sort of, to, to write, you know. Um, you know, just sort of, you've got to let, and, and and you have to actually commit to it. I mean, there's no sort of holding back. And that episode, I remember it really, you know, I remember that it was a big, a lot of stuff happened in that episode. And my job, the way I saw it, was that I had to commit fully to it and, uh, and really um, give everything because uh, that's what makes good drama. And everybody, um, no one's going to be affected by any of it if it's not being full out, full, you know, fully committed. So that that meant I got very involved. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great episode. It had, a, it had a big impact on people. Yeah, you know, and I remember Dorothy's breast cancer story. I mean, I really got into that too, you know, and because all sorts of things happen to people on, and on Neighbours, it was really the full gamut of, um, of life experiences that people were going through and um, I, I always found it just a delight, a privilege really to, to yeah. write. And Dorothy was played by Maggie Dents, wasn't it? Who played Bev Baker on um, Prisoner. A beautiful actor. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. You also wrote some episodes with Reg Watson and, yes. and 
worked again with Elspeth Ballantyne, who played Kathy Alessi. Um, and uh, I also worked on some of those episodes, so it was great to see Elspeth back again. Um, what was it like working with those two prisoner legends? Also, in one episode, you wrote that Jim Robinson, played by Alan Dale, has yes. a heart attack uh, <laughs> while riding a bike. <laughs> well, yeah, I think I just said about what the fun that you, you can have, you know, someone gives you something juicy and it's, you know, off you go, really. Um, Elspeth's a beautiful person. Um, and over the years, you know, we run into each other and uh, she was, you know, a very, very solid, experienced actor when I first met her. And so, you know, I admired her a great deal. And um, that was the case with the legends, uh, you know, <laughs> it, it, it it, it was my first drama job, Prisoner, after, you know, the Daryl and Ozzy comedy fiasco. Um, but, you know, the, these people had a body of kind of work and life experience behind them. So, uh, you know, you either had the choice to be sort of intimidated or, or, um, or learn from them, you know, and um, sometimes it was a bit of both. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of uh, speaking of prisoner, the fans will be itching for us to get into it. One of the All great right. shows on TV, which launched the careers of many people in Australia. Um, you played Sharon Gilmore for twenty seven episodes in nineteen eighty. Had you watched the show prior to coming on it? When I knew I was going on it, I, I sort of did a big, you know, started watching it um, avidly. Mm. <laughs> prior to that, no. Okay. to be honest. <laughs> uh, and I think that's not unusual for actors. It's, it's uh, uh, even now, I, um, I'm not always following things and, you know, often it's, it's catch up now when I find things. Um, yeah, yeah. How did you get the part of Sharon? Did, did you have to audition or, or yeah. do you, do you yes, remember? I, I remember. I remember it well. Um, I remember going into the um, Grundy's office, which back in those days was in sort of inner part of Melbourne, and the beautiful Jan Russ was casting. Well, you must know her quite well. Um, and uh, and I was reading for Sharon with her. So, you know, it was kind of go in there, sit down and, and read the scenes and bingo, um, you got the job. So. Uh, and Jan's lovely, you know, she was great to, to read with. And, and, uh, Do you remember what you had to read back then? Sorry? Do you remember what oh. you had to read? <laughs> oh, no, I wish I did. No, no, I, you, you could, if Jan, I don't even, it was one of the, it was a scene, I'm pretty sure it was a scene that, you know, was with Judy. Um, it, yeah, it was one of those scenes. Um, yeah. Do you know who um, created the character of Sharon? No idea. I don't know how you'd find out. How would you find out? <laughs> we will hopefully learn as we go. <laughs> we've, got, we've got a crew coming on as well, so you never Oh, good. good. Someone will know. Someone will know. You can get Jan on. <laughs> yes, we'd love to. Yeah. Did, did anyone from the cast give you any advice or take you under their wing on your first day? Yes, a um, couple of people. Well, of course, Judy, um, you know, Betty, um, Betty Bobbitt, our um, darling Betty, who's no longer with us. Well, she was kind from the minute I first met her. And uh, Dinah Mann, um, uh, the actress Dinah Mann was on the show at the time and she was very helpful and very kind. Um, I remember that really well. And, um, you know, I've had a chance to socialise with Dinah often um, over the years. And, uh, you know, she's another um, great human being. So, uh, yeah, those gals, those gals um, were very welcoming. You just um, you just mentioned Betty Bobbitt, who we we bring up on most episodes. But is there a special memory you can share about Betty? Because you did work quite closely with her on Prisoner. You had some pretty big parts with her. So yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, 
she was she was just uh, very very experienced and so um, um, she didn't ever try to pull rank or or uh, never you know she treated me as an equal and I think uh, that's what made Betty special she didn't she wasn't standoffish she would get right in there with you um, and we had some you know pretty close scenes yeah. uh, I. And we became, and, and she was she was sad when I when I left, and you know we became friends afterwards. I used to go to her house, went to her house for dinner, and you know, and she would make a point. Um, even in recent couple of years, I think in two thousand and eighteen, she would make a point of coming to see me in a play, and uh, you know, regardless of how difficult it might have been, she would come with a friend, and she she would see things. You know, she was a supportive actor as well. Um, look, to be honest, I think that the things that I remember most were our sort of two-handers where we, um, you know, we would have, uh, I Sharon was, Sharon was immature, but, but, um, but Judy didn't, uh, didn't take advantage of that. And so, you know, when we had, scenes together, it wasn't that hard to kind of get into the um, uh, the sort of meat of the scene. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you say yeah, that- you specifically remember. <laughs> when, when you say that everybody went to Betty Bobbitt's house, including me, I yes. think everybody, everybody went to Betty Bobbitt's house. Um, yes. When you got the part of Sharon, did you know it would be for 27 weeks? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. did you know that you would be playing a love interest for Judy Bryant? Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, yes, it was supposed to be a bit more exciting if I'd sort of was went into it thinking I was going to be in it forever and, you know, I suddenly got axed or, you know, and, you know blotted my copybook or somebody decided that it wasn't working or... No, none of that because it was a storyline that was going to always end the way that it did. Yeah. Um, I seem to have a history of those, don't I? <laughs> Making a pest of myself and then having to go. <laughs> Another question we ask all the guests that come on uh, come on our show is working with the late great Sheila Florence. Do you have a memory that you can share with the well, about Sheila? The late great Sheila Florence. I was terrified of her. Um, would I be the only one who's ever said that? I think so, so far. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so far. Um, okay, so, um, well, it was her, I guess it was her sort of formidable reputation. And I, I, uh, I remind you that I wasn't experienced in television. Um, and uh, this, this green room, this was really like a tunnel underground. Um, my first day was filled with all these kind of awesome legendary kind of actors. And um, I didn't quite, I, I couldn't read Sheila because, you know, she was not somebody that was easy to read because uh, she already was quite established. And, uh, but it was wonderful to watch her uh, working really. I mean, that was enough. And, and you know, not to, um, not to have, uh, If, you, if you're a young actor and you don't have people that you can watch quietly and just sort of take it all in, then um, you're really struggling to learn what you need to be learning. And so she was a, a, a great actor to watch because it was always so easy for her. You know, she was, it was wonderfully easy. And she was wickedly funny, and, you know, like you could, but, but um, and she was, you know, but, but we didn't, um, we didn't get close. Um, I, I became close to, you know, to Betty and and, um, and and some of the makeup girls and you know people coming and going and Fiona Spence, a beautiful person. I mean, there was a lovely, lovely, lovely Gerda Nicholson. I, I got close to too. We used to do Tai Chi together oh. um, in in the um, in the studio. You know, find a dark, quiet corner and. Um, 
do our Tai Chi in, a, in breaks, me and Gerda. <laughs> mm. Mm. Wow. Episode 90, which was written by Lee Spence and directed by Ray Cole, uh, the cameramen were Gil Oberhofer, Barry Pullen, and Ray Grenfell, Grinny Grenny. Uh, your first scene, you pull up in a white Tirana, uh, I believe, and you are dropping drugs at a house that Paul Reed's son is at. Police bust you. Do you remember anything about doing your first scene on an outside broadcast in OB? Well, I remember pulling up in the car. I remember sort of this, it was a whirl, it was a swirl, if you can sort of imagine. This was, we're talking about, you know, 1980 or something. Um, it was also new. I think I was probably just trying to get through it, but I do remember what you just described. Um, and um, and that, of course, you know, those, those legendary um, crew members that you spoke of, again, you know, people were kind to me and uh, looked out, uh, you know, they would have known I was, was, was new. Um, I, I remember just, being overwhelmed by the fact that I did not know what was going on. I just was sort of getting by, really, getting through it. So I hope that didn't show. Oh, sure. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that was a great, so I actually watched it a few nights ago as well. It was terrific. <laughs> what did you remember about it? Was Did I look in control or not? Yeah, no, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was good. Um, Paul Reed, speaking of Paul Reed. Episode 91 was written by George Mallaby, good old Wallaby, and directed by Simon Winsor. Cameramen were Peter Hine, Barry Pullen, and myself. Um, now, also, when we were talking about the OB beforehand, of course, those cameramen were the studio cameramen. The ones that would have been out on OB would have been Steve Mann and either Joe Battaglia or Chris Adford. Yeah, oh, Chris. Oh, yeah, right. Beautiful Chris. Um, okay, so, well, you know, um, the, the, again, without exception, you know, what a great crew and what a great team. Um, all, you know, Chris became a, a director. Yes. Um, a long time. Steve. Yeah, oh, gorgeous Steve, you know, how could you forget Steve? He was just so um, generous I'll have to, and funny. I'll have to <laughs> let him know that. <laughs> your, first, oh, yeah. your first scene inside Wentworth with Meg, Meg Jackson is inducting you and taking your fingerprints. You're inside for drug trafficking. What was it like shooting your first scene in prison with Ellie? Uh, were you were you nervous on your first day? Well, you I, I'm indescribably nervous, and I remember I had. Um, the, you know, I remember the clothes I was wearing, I think a little sort of short sleevey sort of thing on and um, some jeans and I had this fake hair, fake ponytail, because that all got cut off, remember? They took to me with the scissors. And I remember sort of thinking, oh, my ponytail's going to fall off and I won't know what I'm saying. And, you know, and, and I, I could feel, and straight away, of course, Sharon was, um, she, she was, it, it was easy to um, to fight to see the the bratty, you know, difficult sort of side of her, um, and uh, and and you know, I remember having makeup on and everything, and looking around, and, and other people didn't, and it was like, you know, the, suddenly there, I was very aware um, of um, that I was a tad overdressed, really, for the people that would go it was around me and what the hell am I doing here? Um, yeah, no, I, I do remember that very well. Mm. Mm. The, Just being uh, terrified. Mm. The, the, the next scene, which was a great scene in the dining room where uh, you're in the dining room and Queen Bee finds out you're in for drug trafficking and you get into a fight, you throw your food at her or over her. <laughs> it was it was <laughs> what was it like shooting that scene with Val? Oh God! Well, yeah, well, you know, I mean, what? I picked the wrong person, didn't I? To throw my lunch over, honestly. <laughs> um, and she was merciless, like you know, in the character and everything. Um, and um, and and uh, I guess 
I just was getting by on the fact that, well, this is the role, this is the job, and this is what I'm doing. Um, and it led to all kinds of problems for, for Sharon. Um, but, you know, I mean, even things like uh, throwing your food at someone, I mean, nothing. I, I, knew, I knew so little about kind of how complex this was all going to be, how many times we'd have to throw the food or, you know, like what would happen. And, um, so um, if I looked terrified, then I was. If I was hiding it, well, that's good. I was doing my job work. <laughs> yeah, B called you a revolting little worm for a remark you made about Jim Flat Fletcher's family dying. Um, yeah, the, the, any memories of, of that little bit? Well, yes, because, you know, Sharon had a, a, a I suppose, would you say a nasty streak? She she was she could be quite cruel, and um, and uh, and I guess uh, that made her unpopular. And like, look, shallow was a fry pan at times was Sharon, and um, not able to um, uh, see outside her own kind of concerns. I mean, she was. In, in many ways, sort of immature and selfish. So uh, I guess, you know, I was, I was very, very aware that I was um, playing a provocative and at times kind of unlikable person um, who really wasn't prepared to sort of back down or, or let anyone see her true self apart from, um, apart from Judy. Um, and that's what got her into strife. You know, she was she was cockier than she should have been a lot of the time. You know, getting herself into strife because of that. Um, but you know, I think she was fairly needy as well. Yeah. Ooh. The um, the next episode, which was one one six, written by Denise Morgan and directed by Michael Patterson, is your final episode and. I call it an iconic episode because it's a fan favourite. It's still talked about to this day, which is uh, <laughs> you over here, Tommy Dysart, who played Jock Stewart, uh, blackmailing Doreen. So then you try and proposition Jock. And then you meet with an unfortunate death pushed down the stairs. Well, we don't see you get pushed down the stairs. No. Uh, for some reason, they didn't show that. But we see you at the bottom of the stairs. What was it like shooting your, uh, your final scene? Oh, that was a sad day. I remember being very emotional that day because I, you know, it had been such an important um, journey for me. And uh, and I don't know. I did. I I got on famously with Tommy. We had great fun. And uh, what a fabulous actor and person. Um, you know, I, I don't know why he didn't sort of respond to my charms. I don't know. I mean, Sharon sort of was sort of what's wrong with him. Um, and um, and so I, I just remember, you know, vividly and just the sort of the way that he kind of, you know, came in very close and we, we were there, we were, and I thought that I was kind of as clever as you like and getting away with it. Next thing you know, I was. Yeah, um, mm, but, you know, this sort of, this was, this was t sort of vintage Sharon, really. She sort of had a plan and, um, and didn't really, she and underestimated, you know, the people um, around her. Uh, yeah, she was lucky to have Judy. Yeah. Mm. The Tommy Dysart. How how did you um work well work with him? You know, as an actor. Um, any thoughts on on Tom? Uh, <laughs> It was just so funny. I mean, it, you know, like he's such a big guy, wasn't he? You know, so big and and that really, really deep voice. Um, I used to just love listening to him talk and would sort of talk to him just in order to be able to, you know, so, <laughs> say that again, Tommy. Say, say that again. Say that again. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, well, he, he had a... Um, a dry wit, Tommy. You know, yes. Probably remember that. Mm, yes. 
yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and a big teddy bear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Love, yeah, little cuddle chops. Yeah. <laughs> One episode I do quickly want to touch on that you weren't in, but it, it's, a, it's another fan favourite, which is still, again, spoken about today, is where Judy ends up working in a brothel because of Jock and she pushes him down the stairs and kills him. And fans still visit that outside broadcast location and reenact that scene to this day. <laughs> it's, they're, they're laying down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you actually watch that episode at all? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I, <laughs> it was such a wonderful ending for him, wasn't it? <laughs> it's a bit of sweet revenge. Yeah. Yes. No, you know, it was, yeah. it was cool. I, I didn't know that fans did that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> was was it your choice to leave uh, prisoner, or or did you know that you were going to be written out? No, I knew. I knew from the start. That's my the story of my life, I guess. Really, <laughs> I got offered a juicy, juicy role. I was grateful for it and loved doing it. But I always knew it was coming to an end. Mm. I did get a surprise when I was invited back a few years later. They recognised me. Recognize me, but you know, that was what was we were doing then. Well, that was my next question was episode 540. You are back in prison, not as an inmate, but as Terry Malone, an officer, which is really rare for prisoner. They I mean they always had cast come back and play different parts, but it was rare for an inmate and an officer. Um yeah. how'd you get the part of Terry? I was offered that straight up, you know. Um and uh yeah it and I did wonder, I thought, will this, will this float, you know, will this fly, will, will people accept this? Um, but because the characters were so incredibly different um, in terms of, you know, what they were fundamentally um, doing, although, again, you know, another self-centred human being um, was Terry. Uh, but, you know, again, uh, I, I think, well, I think they, they obviously liked me as an actor in there. So, you know, um, and where, who's going to fit for um, Maggie? Who's going to work with Maggie? Um, how's that going to kind of play out? So they had their ideas about that storyline. It was just a question of finding the right person. And uh, I'm glad it was me because... I uh, initially I, I did wonder whether that was going to fly, but it, I ended up having a ball with Maggie on that. That was a great, a great role and a great story. Um, one that I and I found it. I in you know in some ways I found it a lot easier. I was a few years older and I'd been around a bit, so um, it was a you know entirely different experience uh, coming back like that. Infinitely infinitely easier in many ways. Yeah. So you, you didn't audition for Terry? No. Nope. And did you know much about the character and it was going to play a love interest for um, Joan Ferguson when you Yeah, I, I knew enough about what was going to happen and um, uh, of course it was all sort of theoretical and it always is until you really get in there and start working. And I, I didn't know Maggie. Um, I hadn't met Maggie in other um, areas or come across each other, uh, and uh, so it was a very, but it was it was a very professional relationship Maggie and I had, and um, and I think to our, both our credits we worked really hard at you know making sure that 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 storyline worked. There was a lot a lot for writing on it, um, and um, you know, and it was a, it was a real. It was a matter of sort of personal pride to, to, to be able to um, nut that out and work together with somebody of her calibre, somebody like Maggie. Uh, you know, you, you, people don't see the kind of the, the work that you do behind the scenes. They see the, you know, the scenes on, on television, but um, what went into it, the thought and care and, and time that went into making those scenes work. Um, you know, Maggie and I would put our heads together on that. And, and, uh, and I think we did. We did have the um, yeah. We did. We, you know, there was a there was a the, the right kind of chemistry. It was the right um, balance because I mean, it, it, where was this going to go? You know, 
had to be asking yourself, where would this go? Definitely. Yes, there was, there was definitely a rapport between the two of you. And, yeah. and it, it came out on screen. Episode uh, 540 was written by Ian Coglin and directed by Sean Nash, which oh. aired on the 28th of May, 1985. The camera crew, the studio camera crew were Wayne Lavender, David Triscott and myself. Your first scene in reception, checking the visitor's book and Joan Ferguson, played by Maggie Kirkpatrick walks in and you tell Joan that you forgot to get the last batch of visitors to sign out and you were doing the signatures yourself. <laughs> you plead with her not to tell the governor. Joan says it will be our little secret. Uh, this, this is where Joan instantly had feelings for Terry and what was it like working with Maggie shooting those scenes and having an on-screen intimate relationship? Mm. Well, you know, I mean, there's, 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 there's flagging the kind of nature, Terry's nature, like, you know, she's kind of already up to no good forging. <laughs> A little bit of Sharon coming out in Terry. <laughs> well, I, you know, that you, you, you sort of, I suppose, assume that there was some, um, a reason why, you know, my name might, that would have come up, um, that Terry needed to, um, I guess in many ways fool Joan for this to work, you know. Um, and there was a lot of manipulating going on and there was a lot of kind of power plays and and uh, and Terry knew pretty st well straight away. I knew straight away that that I obviously had an, had made an impression on um, on uh, on Joan, and um, and that's sort of like okay, well that's going to serve, that's going to be useful, you know. Um, this is all going to be useful um, because Terry was sort of, uh, again, you know, what's in it for me? You know, what's in it for me was um, much of what was driving that. Yeah. So um, we know by 1985, Prisoner was a very big, big hit and ratings were really high. Did you feel more nervous coming back as Terry because it was so big rather than when you were playing Sharon or you had no nerves at all because you'd already worked on Prisoner? It was much, much easier for me. I was much more experienced and um, a bit older and um, I'd been there before. And being invited back kind of, you know, that was nice. You know, it was nice to be invited back to not have to kind of prove myself in, in a, I didn't feel it at the same pressure. Okay. Yeah. Did, did you have a, a favourite storyline through, you know, during well, those episodes? With, with Terry? Mm. Well, I did really love those. When we, look, when we moved in together, yeah. and there was just sort of this little domestic thing that Terry was playing, you know, domestics. Um, of course, it was all real for Joe. Um, I loved all that, you know, playing house. I loved all that. Um, and, you know, as, as an actor, truly, um, whether you're being, whether things are going well or whether things are going badly, it's all juicy, you know, like you just get yourself involved. And, um, you know, reading all those scenes of when, you know, when she started breaking um, Joan's heart and the hideous things she'd say to her and, um, the way she had around her little finger and just kind of used Joan, um, it was all great fun, you know. It's like it's, it was all really a challenge about how to um, how to convince Joan that Terry was genuine, that I, you know, um, without and 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 Joan did believe, you know, she she really was was hurt by Terry, so. Um, getting, getting away with getting what I wanted was, uh, was fun. How to do that with a character like uh, Joan. Um, I found all of that really good fun. How to be, how to be on top, how to get on top yeah. in my own special way. <laughs> <laughs> now your, um, your hair was quite different 
when you come back as Terry, was yeah. it did the producers tell you to like change it because you, they didn't want you to look like uh, like Sharon too much? Was that a um, or was it just like that? I had already cut my hair, um, and the and I sort of I wasn't crazy about it after a while when I'd cut my hair, and then this came along, and so. Um, I just kept cutting it and had to even cut a little bit more off um, so that I did um, really sort of, I guess, accentuate the fact that it was short and just allowed it to stay short and even a little bit shorter. Um, it's very different. Interesting. Yeah. Did, you, did you have a particular process for learning your lines? We asked. Yes. All this. Well, yeah, well, back then, um, of course, I had a much better memory. <laughs> I was younger. Uh, learning lines was was probably was in some ways a lot easier. Um, and I, I noticed this because my 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 eldest daughter's an actress. That lines are easier when you're you're yet, you've got a younger brain. Um, but I did always find that things became a lot easier once. I'd really had a chance to get the, hat, the whole script into my hands, you know, that, that, um, that I, needed the, I needed to understand where everything fitted into the story. Um, and um, to this day, you know, unless I can read the whole script, it really becomes um, so much easier. So you're never learning things out of context and always gets easier once you've had, um, your characters established and your relationships are established and you're able to um but but you know now i'll use anything recording i'll use anything i can that i i'll try anything to learn and and retain um lines now including recording was back then i didn't use to do that which is what i'm saying i think the younger brain um it's easier, but you know, as an actor, you still have to do it. So you get more techniques and tricks. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I'm not. I don't live with any actors, so you know, it was always about finding um, you know, a way to do it, uh, pretty much on your own. And the speed of it, you know, the speed of it was was right. intense. We'd run our lines in the dressing rooms, in the green room. You know. Yeah. So. Being a writer yourself, did you did you like the way they were developing the character of Terry Malone? Were you happy with all the storylines and, and everything with, with that? Yeah, you know, and, and Denise Morgan wrote some really cool stuff um, yeah. for, um, for Terry and, and Joan. Um, look, the juicier the better, and I would really like lap it up, you know, get the, get the writers to give us the, um, the you know, as much juice as as they can um no i was i wasn't um I, I back then i wasn't writing soap it was after um i wasn't writing series television it was after that that i started writing yep. and and i i don't i don't think i had time to be too analytical about um the script, it was just that if it was a good quality script, we all knew it and we were all, you know, didn't, didn't we, Ken? I mean, like you'd go, oh, this is a good script and, you know, get a good director into it and they had something to work with, something juicy. And, and there was no end of juicy drama in Prisoner. I mean, it was just, that's why I suppose it's been so popular. So much um, real drama and conflict between um, the characters and most of them women. Um, we, you've really covered my next question, which was, did you ever want to write for Prisoner? Um, I, I guess that was pre your writing days, so you, you probably didn't consider it. Well, I never asked anybody could I write for Prisoner. I probably would have been fun, would have been good. Um, no, I didn't really develop that. You know, one of the reasons that I sort of got into television writing was really because when I had a baby it was getting harder and harder to to sort of juggle work and getting out and you know doing theatre things like that 
So um, I wanted to do something that I could also do um, at home that was still in the industry. So I was juggling that with my voiceovers and various things. Um, and, uh, and I had written some theatre stuff and some children's radio and um, some corporate stuff. And so, uh, you know, I wanted to, I fancied the idea. Awesome. So 1980 versus 1985 on Prisoner, what were the big differences you noticed coming back on set, you know, with Prisoner being so much, so much more developed at the time compared to at the start? Yes, well, again, you know, there's a lot of, there was a lot of uh, confidence and, and some people, of course, had been around a very long time and, um, uh, the things things were working pretty smoothly, uh, and you know when you're different yourself, things appear occur differently for you anyway. They appear and seem different. How different really they were is probably something that you know more than I can. How different things really were. Um. <laughs> yes, we we were starting. It, it had been a long plod from from 1978 through to 1985. And yes, um, we were we were pretty set in our ways, uh, crew wise, and um, uh, it, it, we were weren't exactly jaded, but it had been a long a long trip, a long mm -hmm. journey. Episode uh, five seventy six, which was written by Coral Druin and directed by Mandy Smith. The cameramen were Wayne Lavender, Peter Hind, and myself. And this episode is rare as it's a side of Joan Ferguson that we never really see, and it's your final episode. Did you know you would be playing Terry Malone for 25 episodes to begin with? Yep, it's been yes to all of those questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And how, how did you feel at the end of the second stint? Oh, very, very, very satisfied. And I remember Maggie giving me, I think it was a book. It was a, it was a lovely gift that she wrote in. It was a book and it had meant a lot to me professionally, frankly, to be able to um, successfully do that, you know, achieve what we achieved together um, and um, have that storyline work, work the way that it did. And um, I felt very proud of that, and very happy. And I'd made some, I made some more friends, and and had, um, I think, uh, just a lot more confidence and just more awareness of what had ha had just happened. Um, it's always good to go out on a high, you know, to have yeah. something work and go boom. That was good. I was lucky because I had the benefit of being able to be in two really interesting roles Definitely. with enough episodes to get my you know teeth into and have some development and um and have them be different and uh and have them be um i guess uh, well received for what they were what they set out to do and what they achieved so you know i i think that was for me it was like ticking a box going right that was good that worked um, and um, it was fun, so you know, no regrets. <laughs> <laughs> the um, the next scene I just want to talk about quickly um, is because it's it's a brilliant two scenes, which is your last scenes, which I rewatched the other night, and they they just worked so well together. Joan calls you a bitch and tells you that you've got ice water in your veins, which is <laughs> it's, it's a big call coming from Joan. But then you're at a you're. <laughs> You're having a walk, you're at some park, and you said, we've got nothing, Joan. You're a weak, gutless old woman. Disgust you. You don't want her anymore. You've lost everything for her, your job, your home, your family. She was never what you wanted physically, but you put up with it. We have nothing, Joan. You almighty, all-powerful freak, which is rare because we never hear another officer call Joan the freak. It's always an inmate. Um, mm -hmm. And Joan's just accepting it all, which is, again, rare. We never see Absolutely. Joan Ferguson just take all that. So, I mean, she must have really loved Terry. Um, 
what was that scene like to film with Maggie? I mean, that was pretty intense, that scene. Yeah, yeah, it really was very intense. I remember, you know, like being kind of the night before and, and just building up to that. You know, we talked a lot about it then and, and Maggie and, you know, just making sure that I was really, really sort of felt really strong with, with the lines and didn't have any kind of... Um, because I, ha I just had to go for it. Those... Who wrote that episode again? Wasn't... I think you it know? Was Coral Drone. Yeah. Coral oh, yeah. Drone. Yeah. Well, yeah. Coral's terrific. And um, so there was absolutely no sort of halfway with that. You don't give actors lines like that. And then there's no other way to do it than half. <laughs> so it was a full kind of going and committing to that and um, saying that stuff to, to Joan, to, you know, was just like, It was vicious, just vicious. And the fact that, and it's like the more she took it, the worse I got. Yeah. You know, worse and worse and worse. The more she took it, the more horrible Terry became. So it was, um, yeah, I mean, what was, what, what on earth would, you know, would Joan um, be, be taking that for unless, um, at the time anyway, uh, she was, you know, really, really, really in love with Terry. Um, so it was kind of great fun to see Joan then kind of refuse to answer the door and, you know, just let it bang on the door and rot in hell. Just one, thing, one thing I did find funny about that scene at the pub, well, not funny, but after all that, that you, you know, you lash out at her like that. And then Joan is like, well, let me know where you want me to send your TV. That was. The... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's a piece of work. Um, <laughs> you know, I really expected the fans would just hate me, hate, uh, you know, like, uh, and they probably, lots of them probably did, you know, like, you know, how could Terry treat Joan like that? Um, but then there were those that thought that, you know, Joan deserved it the way that Joan had treated other people. So yeah. um, it was sort of exciting. Yeah. <laughs> it was exciting. Very, I was very meaty. Yeah. Great scene. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, we might come to some questions from the fans. Uh, Richard Bobbins Duffer. Uh, prefaces this by saying, I'm only asking this since Maria Mercedes said she noticed a huge difference between her two stints. So his question is, I'd like to ask if Margot's experiences of her time on the series were different for each role and what were the main similarities and differences each time you appeared? Oh, I think in part I answered that just a little bit earlier um, to some extent. Uh, I guess that smooth... Um, in the second, the second time round, it wasn't as new and it wasn't as sort of, a, 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 it wasn't new for everybody in that same way. I mean, when I started, it was still pretty early days, um, more established. And, uh, oh, look, no, I, I don't, not the way that Marie's obviously described, no, not, not in the same way. Um, the, the fact that time had passed, I would expect things to be different and yep. changed. Um, they're just more established. Next question from Jason Allen. Hi, Margot. I really liked your impression of Jock's accent. What were your happiest moments working on Prisoner? <laughs> oh, dear. I used to take him off. Um, Can you still do that? Gary, you near? Gary, I don't know if I was good at it or not, but you know, it's, it's, um, it's so fun. Say that again, I'd say to, to Tommy. Say it again. I'm going to copy you. I'm going to copy you. Um, so, uh, yeah, look, I had a great time with Amanda too, Amanda Muggleton, you know, yeah. Yeah. Christy Latham. Um, we had a ball. Um, just getting into the sort of whole steamy nature of that little uh, thing that happened between us. Um, 
I got used to the fights. Um, I kind of, in the end, you know, that I used to be terrified of all the fighting and, and the, you know, the, the, the times I used to get pushed and around and, and um, uh, you know, intimidated and, and shoved it. But in the end, you know, I got sort of quite comfortable with it and, you know, giving us somebody else a slap or, but you know, one of the, um, yeah, look, the key, the key, there were the key relationships that I had, I guess, was, um, was, you know, with Betty was a highlight, with Maggie was a highlight, with Amanda was a highlight, with Tommy, they were all, they were all my, my highlights. Yeah. Just the work, just the work. Yeah. Just being part, just being, knowing that you're part of something that um, was so different. Um, women getting, you know, strong, meaty roles in, in, in that sense, you know, we weren't sort of on the sidelines. We were right in there. Yeah. Yes. Stuart, Stuart Carey says, I'd love to ask Margot if she was aware of the impact her initial character, Sharon, would bring to the show. She was there for 26 episodes, but one of those great characters that caused a huge impact and was pivotal in exploring the other characters' darker sides and introducing new characters. Sharon seemed to bring out the worst in every character <laughs> except Judy although she was well aware of her failings. Were you disappointed the character died and did you enjoy working with Val, Betty, Amanda and Tommy Dysart, which you've yeah. already answered? Um, when you returned as Terry, were you aware Sharon had had such an impact? Some would remember her and find it hard to accept you as an actress in a different role on the show. But that was kind of the way things were, as you said. Yeah. Back well, I don't know. Did people accept accept it, or was it a problem for people? I don't know. I have well, not heard people say that. Um, I've just, I've just the only kind of communication I've had is that people were quite, quite enjoyed seeing the, the differences. Um, uh, and you know, the, I think I just said what some of those highlights were. Sharon did bring out um, a darker side of other people, but only I think because she had such a sort of dodgy um, moral compass. I mean, she was uh, prepared to, you know, she was a survivor, you know, street smart, I guess. So, you know, other people would deal with her on her own terms. She got what she was, what was coming to her, really. Um, people, you know, you, you, you deal with people like that on their own terms. So, you know, <laughs> she triggered a lot of her own troubles. Yeah, that's true. Um, this is just a comment, not a question from Cherie Dawn. Wow, I can't wait for this. Her time was short-lived on the show, but made a huge impact. Well, that's nice, isn't it? I mean, it, you know, I just love, it's great to hear that. Um, you know, it's great to hear that you can be a baddie. <laughs> you know, she... <laughs> and have an impact. <laughs> and have an impact. <laughs> If you're hearing a few strange sounds in the background, it's actually my dog sneezing. <laughs> I was wondering what that was. <laughs> the, uh, the next question is from Michael Knight. Are we related? Just kidding. Um, can you remember what was the hardest scene that you had to shoot on Prisoner, whether it was as Terry or, or Sharon? Oh. I, I do remember being finding the first sort of fight scene where I got kind of picked on and B kind of had got stuck into me. I found that really difficult till I got around the, um, the sort of, you know, how to work with uh, fighting and on screen, screen, you know, violence and, you know, how not to get hurt. And um, so it wasn't the drama and it wasn't the acting. It was those sorts of things that were challenging to begin with. Anne, uh, Anne Pitkin. Now we've we've actually pared down Anne's questions a little bit because mm -hmm. most of them you've you've answered proceeding. Um, she'd like to say thank you for playing Sharon, one of my favourite storylines in Prisoner. The public prefer for lesbians to be neither seen nor heard, and they like to have stereotypes reinforced that we're mad or bad or ugly and repressed 
and were usually killed off. What was the reaction of the public to Sharon having a same-sex relationship on television? New Idea magazine article in April 1980 with the beautiful Fiona Spence mentions you as a trained dancer. Do you still like dancing? I love dancing, but I don't um, don't pursue it at all anymore. Um, I uh, I guess you know that the uh, the dancing came first before the acting. Funnily enough, it was when I realised that my feet were hopeless. I didn't have good feet that I realised that you know that was not going to be a career choice. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, it's it stayed with me in terms. Of, loving movement and you know having 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 good posture always having good posture <laughs> important was um, for ballet uh it started with ballet I went, yeah, ballet. yeah janice robertson asked are you friends or in touch with anyone from the show which you mentioned alan hopgood before but is there anyone else that you're uh still well, i used to i used to see betty um i um uh, oh, God, there's so many people that went on to that show, weren't there? Gosh. Yeah. Um, oh, I um, occasionally, um, you know, every, every year I see uh, Deb Lawrence at their sort of mutual social functions. Um, I used to be a good mate and, and, and travelled and toured with Anne Phelan. Um, Brian Greentree is a good friend of mine. Kirst, um, Kirsty Charles is a good friend of mine. Um, yeah, people of, of sort of of that era, I guess, um, that I see, still see, and still are friends with. This is this is a statement from from Anthony Verasso, who says he loves hearing your voice on many voiceovers and TV commercials, even today. Yes, yes. Well, it's a still a big part of what I do um, since COVID nineteen. The um, and all the lockdowns, you know, I, I created, um, created, I put together, you know, this, my studio to, so I could work at home, um, so I can record, still record voiceovers um, through, right throughout the lockdown, which I've been doing. So um, that's uh, lucky for me. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the commercials you do the, with the voiceovers? Oh. You, you're not seriously going to ask me to remember like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. That means, uh, oh. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, lots and lots and lots. Yeah, um, just about. I mean, I've often done in I, recent in recent years. I often end up doing things like for, for banks or serious stuff. Like people got to be able to trust someone with their money, so they'll give it give voiceovers that are kind of serious to more mature voices. Okay. People like, people like me. I remember doing it earlier this year, I did a pitch for a COVID-19 vaccination program for the Victorian government. We were all doing pitches for the Victorian government. Um, I don't remember what happened to any of this stuff because some of it you hear and some of it never gets made and some of it does and doesn't happen. Um, I rather wish the Victorian government had done more in terms of vac vaccination campaigns. I wish the uh, federal government had done more in terms of vaccination campaigns. However, I don't want to get political. <laughs> no, but it's <laughs> true. I mean, it's, it's true. It's very true. <laughs> There's a, no shortage of actors doing pitches. <laughs> Not enough evidence of, um, of, uh, of really good campaigns. And there've been, there were some good campaigns written by quite a few um, advertising agents this mystifies me why they weren't really used properly. Yeah. So I will get political. Watch out. <laughs> oh, no, well, no, welcome to. We, um, yeah. And, uh, I mean, you know, the, the performing arts sector has really suffered. Suffered terribly. Through yeah. COVID and uh, yeah. had no help from the government or. No. I mean, we were all, we've all lost all manner of work. I mean, it <laughs> really has been um, as tough, about as tough a couple of years as, as you could have really. I have many, many colleagues. Um, my own daughter's terribly affected by lockdowns. Um, you know, lo losing, when it is your work, when it is what you do, when it's it's more than just your work, it's, 
it's uh, it's you know for people that's bread on the table it's um it's the only thing they can do it's what they've always done so you know are people any less deserving of um support just because they happen to work in the arts i don't think so you know in um there are other countries and europe europe's and, and uk is a good example where there's a massive amount of support for the arts yeah uh, you know, in terms of rescue rescue packages, uh, but uh, it it's not been the same to the same extent. Um, I think um, Tina Arena really nailed it on the head the other day on that interview. I don't know if you saw it. Mm -hmm. just, you know. Well, yeah, <laughs> go to France. Go go somewhere where where um the arts is really valued. You know, you <laughs> have to you have to to uh, I mean, I'm, 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 I don't really want to express my disappointment too much, but I, it doesn't surprise me with the government that we have. That's all. That, yeah, I shouldn't. We shouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Uh, that it's that it that it's been so. I guess you know, generally artists are a little bit more. Sub, they're more subversive. They often are not conservatives, so they're perhaps not going to be voting for the current government. Um, there's not the perception is that there's not a lot of bang for your buck by really worrying too much about the arts, except that you know the arts generate a huge amount <laughs> for the economy, and uh, and that's what's seen people through lockdown. You know, being able to um, switch on their their uh, devices and stream things, but it's the live performing arts that that you know that's the thing that's heartbreaking. It's suffering. Um, Andrew Barton said, what was it like working on Chances, which was another great show, uh, as you played Lorraine Parsons on the soap in the early days? Do you remember yeah. Chances with Jeremy? Yes, I did. I did, I did about eight weeks or something on that. Um, yes, well, you know, I was, I had a strong storyline with, um, with uh, the actor Jeremy Chances, who's gone on to do some really interesting, interesting work. That was great fun. Um, you know, uh, playing a, a social life. Um, look, the shows that there, there really was nothing. There's there's nothing like Prisoner. Um, so, I, you know, I I don't know if there's much of a Chances fan club. Oh, there is actually. <laughs> oh, there is. Yeah, <laughs> there is. Um, I'm up for everything. Yeah, look, that was that was a job. For me, that was was a, a fun fun couple of months. Um, uh, you try to do the very best you can with 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 everything. You know, that's the way. It's always a gift to get to get a, a role. Yeah. Our um, our final question, mm -hmm. fan question, from David Beards, and and you've touched on it, but he's he wanted to ask: Did you have any reservations? playing a lesbian or probably more specifically a bisexual in that era did did it bother you at, at all or you just took it as another job yes i took it as another job but i also thought you know um i'm not in any position to kind of make um calls on you know whether uh what i was portraying or at the time in terms of what was out there, whether it was a, a really good reflection of what people's own experience was like or not. We kind of had to wait for the audience to tell us that. The only thing that Betty and I could do was kind of be as real and authentic. That was really, with with um, Judy was the only time that Sharon was kind of um, authentic. Um, in that, in that, inside that relationship. Um, so it was really, a, we had to wait and see how people took it. You know, the, the, uh, there was, there was nothing in my kind of head that would suggest to me that um, the relationships that we were portraying would not be, the, the only, the, my feeling was that the only way that people would not accept us was if we weren't being genuine, we weren't real. Um, 
and uh, so there were there, as I said these are not it's not these are not sort of personality traits this is the, these are people's who they are it's their genuine um, expression yep. so we just had to re be as authentic as we could as actors um, there was a couple more things that slid through on the uh, Talking Prisoner Facebook page just yesterday. I know we're just about out of time, but do you mind just another five more minutes yeah. so I can... Um, there was one from Laura Welsh who said, please tell her that her roles were inspirational because they showed very different types of women from the norm. They were an encouragement to live my differences out with confidence. And then she went on to say that there was a debate among fans that the writers got cold feet with the ending of the storyline of Joan and Terry. Was it? Was that right? Do you remember? Gee, well, it's not a debate that I'm aware of, but that's not to say that there may not be. I mean, I, I, I don't know the veracity of that, how um, true that is. I, I guess that hopefully you may find more out about that with the writers or... I didn't hear that. Um, I, yeah, I didn't hear that, so I couldn't comment. Um, she also said, thank you so much, and you are such an inspiring Australian Margot Knight. Best regards from a dedicated fan in South... She's actually in South Korea. Um, That's next lovely. one was Paul. So these are just comments. Paul Beatty said, loved both characters. Such a wonderful, amazing actress. Isabel Lorraine Cuthbert said, met her and she was so lovely, sat in the canteen and she had a wine. <laughs> Did I? <laughs> Back in the days when I used to drink, not anymore. <laughs> um, Gail said, Margot Knight is such a truly an amazing actress. Cole Taylor went on to say, I liked her as Terry. Wish she had been in it longer and stayed as a screw as I could have been potential for a lot more work friction between her and Joan. Nicholas Janity said, such an amazing voiceover talent. And Stuart James Foy said, really looking forward to this. I met Margot some years back. She is so lovely. Oh. So just some uh, extra comments there. <laughs> Oh, it really is because you know um, people that like to, like that are interested in your work. You know, it's nice to hear that. Um, uh, and uh, and look, you know, I would have been more than happy to kind of ex to to keep going in, in in either of those roles. But you know, it really is they really were gifts. Um, and and uh, there is that expression: leave them wanting more. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you really are a fan. I mean, we're in a lot of the Facebook groups and the prisoner groups and the fan clubs and, you know, not just on our Facebook page, but you see a lot of remarks about you and your characters and how well you portrayed them and, and how brilliant you were at doing that. So, yeah, it's not oh, just... Look, I, 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 was, I was really... It was great to meet some of the fans those years ago. Was it the 100th year celebration at the forum? I can't remember quite when, when it was. Um, and, uh, you know, I met a lot of people that night too. And I also met people um, in Birmingham when I was in the UK. I had a, a day up there um, and just met some, some great um, fans. And, and I, I didn't realise the extent to which, uh, you know, new audiences are always coming forward to, um, to watch because it's, uh, it, it, it's often young people that I end up, meeting and, and they're into it. So, you know, for me, that's always been great fun, you know, that, that it keeps getting a new audience. Which I do want to ask you, because this, this question is always a fan question, but for some reason, no one asked at this time was, have you watched the Wentworth, the new Wentworth? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I did. I mean, it's, it's well done and, and it is it's just a good, it's a good, good show. But I, it's very hard to compare. Yeah, I can't compare it. You know, it's like it's no. chalk and cheese, really. Um, I look at it as, as as a fresh and different kind of um, show altogether. Uh, you know, it looks a lot slicker, doesn't it? <laughs> it has a different. No, no offense there, Ken, but you know, like the technology, <laughs> the technology's um, 
and and everything it, it, it's like it makes you realize just um how much has changed in terms of technology um oh look i'm not i'm not uh able to really follow series television in quite the way that um uh, that i would really get totally attached as i said i tend to watch things after they've already gone to air and get involved in in things that um it was a, an era it was a time and uh and, and now it's it's different it's very well done though i think it's yeah. fantastic yeah. Yeah. Anything you'd like to uh, add, Ken, before we sign off? No, I, th I think we've just about covered everything. Thank you so much, Margot. It's, it's been fun and it's only been about 40 years, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. And, uh, you yeah, know, I remember you very, very well, Ken. Yes, as I said, it was a very, very friendly and um, kind crews that you know really did hold our hands <laughs> yeah so yeah thank and, you very much well. lovely to meet you matt too thank you so no, much. it's been an absolute pleasure to meet you so this will be up on the talking prisoner youtube page and available on all the podcast platforms as well including apple and spotify which you can all download mm -hmm.